Hello, my name is Professor John Buscombe. I am a specialist in nuclear medicine. Um, I work at Bart's House in uh, London in the United Kingdom, and I'm also a professor of nuclear medicine at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. So today we're going to look, look at the evidence for peptide receptor radiotherapy. This may be a concept which you know about or a new concept. Hopefully by the end of the talk, we will know what this concept is and the evidence base behind it. I work for uh, with consultancy and lectures for a company called Advanced Accelerator Applications, who manufactures a form of PRRT. I've also done lectures paid for Boston Science Medical. This is not uh, related to the topic I'm talking about today. And likewise, I've done consultancy for British Standards Institute on the registration of uh, radionuclide therapies and have been the past president of the British Nuclear Medicine Society. So we can talk a little bit about what is PRRT, why it may work in neuroendocrine tumours or neuroendocrine neoplasia, some early work with PRRT, then the development of the lutetium-177 dotatate, which is the present form of PRRT, uh, finishing off with the results of the NETA-1 trial, and then I'll summarise our findings. Now, I'm sure all of you are aware why we do clinical trials. It provides an evidence base for clinical practice. It provides data for both looking at toxicity and efficacy, which is required when you're obtaining consent. And it provides the evidence required, for example, for either the uh, national um, health systems or for insurance companies to determine whether or not it's worth reimbursing a treatment. Also, if these trials are run well, it compares your particular treatment with different treatment modalities. So the basis of peptide receptor radiotherapy or PRRT are quite simple. Uh, you have a target cell, which normally has on it a receptor. Uh, in this case, for neuroendocrine tumors, it's the somatostatin 2 subtype receptor. And then you have a ligand, which binds to that receptor. There's often a linker molecule that then enables you to put on a therapeutic isotope. So you in normally inject these agents intravenously and they will travel around the body, find the tumor, attach the tumor, and then provide local radiotherapy. The principle of PRRT is based on the principle of theragnostics, which is a mixture between therapy and diagnostics. So first of all, we need to have a dedicated diagnostic agent. And in neuroendocrine tumors, there are three possible diagnostics which are used in different parts of the world. There's indium pentetratide. There is something called technicic hynectate. And there is gallium-68 dotatate. All these are somatostatin analogs uh, with high affinity for the uh, type 2 uh, receptor. Our preferred method is the gallium-68 dotatate because we can use that with PET imaging, which gives us better images and resolution. But access to this around the world is quite difficult. Now, if you see good uptake on a scan, then there is an increased probability of treatment working. So for example, in clinical trials of PRRT with lutetium dotatate, that's not a big secret, they show positive results in terms of patient outcomes in about 85% of patients. But those patients have been pre-selected by a somatostatin imaging system. So you choose those patients most likely to work. Also, you can check there's very little uptake in normal tissue, which will help you to reduce side effects. Now, for this, we need a radiopeptide. And these, as I said before, these are all based on the somatostatin system. Most of these came out of the University of Basel. Uh, did a lot of the original work on the artificial somatostatin, such as octreotide. And 
some of these peptides are converted from commercial sources, such as landrotide or octreotide. But more recently, there have been unique uh, peptides which have been optimized for radionuclide therapy, and they include octreotate, octreonoc, and some of the somatostatin uh, antagonists, though we don't have any information on therapy with those yet. Normally, a complex molecule called DOTA is used to then be your linker, and it, that can link to different isotopes such as indium and technetium for imaging and gallium for PET, but also for treatment, we can use yttrium and lutetium. So the story goes back really to the end of the 1990s, and the first attempt to do this came from a game from the Basel team, and they tried to iodinate octreotide. So almost any peptide chain can be iodinated. And they tried to use this in a uh, series of neuroendocrine tumors, or what they assumed were neuroendocrine tumors, working with an endocrinologist from Rotterdam called Eric Krenning. And they did find three out of four uh, gastrointestinal and pancreatic net tumors. It was positive in two meningiomas, but negative in an incidentoma. Um, three medullary cell carcinomas and an adrenal cell carcinoma. But they did note that the iodine 123, the chemistry was not very easy and it tended to disassociate from the cells. So by late image in 24 hours, you would just see the free iodine 123. So the next thing was to use a radio metal, and that was indium 111 and a DCPA linker. So Eric Crane and his team in Rotterdam and the Basel team worked on the use of indium DTPA octotide, and their first cases were published in 1990. By 1993, they'd uh, imaged over 1,000 patients, and they found around 90% of neuroendocrine tumors, um, except for some G3 nets, insulinomas. Uh, these were exempt, but most of them had about 90% of them had uptake. For the more uh, aggressive net tumors, and that we now know that's with a key 67 of more than 20%, um, and with insulinomas, only about 50% positive. Since about 2010, we've also added CT to this imaging with a technique called SPEC CT. And you can see here, this is a, a blobogram of an indium octotide study. And you can see here, I can tell you that the two blobs at the bottom are actually the kidneys, there's normal renal activity. And sometimes you see more co normal colonic activity. So you may assume that the activity at the top of the page is colon, but when you do a spec CT, you can actually see that, in fact, these are peritoneal metastasis. So we now do spec CT as standard with these single photon techniques with the gallium 68 dotatate and PET. These days, that's always done with PET CT. So moving on to the gallium somatostatins, uh, this has became available since around about 2001, and the work was mainly done, uh, obviously, in Basel chemistry. The clinical work was done in Hanover and Heidelberg. And a very early study actually from, from Austria showed that 84 patients imaged with the dotatate uh, and compared with indium uh, pentetratide was what we had before, was if you weren't on a lesion by lesion basis, the sensitivity was 97% with the PET technique compared with 52% with the uh, indium octreotide, which is where it's available, we do prefer, if we can, to use the gallium 68 uh, products. So this is not a, from their paper, this is from another paper which I was involved in uh, from London. And here you have a patient who has a neuroendocrine tumor. And if you look on the black and white images first, you can see there's a single dot in the middle of the abdomen, which is the primary tumor. But when you look at the liver on the planar images and at the bottom on the tomographic images, you can't see any focal uptake in the liver. However, you look at the colored image, this is the gallium 68 dotatate PET CT. You can see that unfortunately the liver is completely riddled with tumor, showing the superiority of this gallium technique. Before we consider um, therapy, it's important to look at some of the preclinical work that was done, and this was done again in the 1990s. And first of all, group, the group in Rotterdam, um, uh, de Jong, uh, Marion de Jong and her team looked at this at the cellular level, 
and we're able to look at different candidates for therapy, comparing with the, at that time, the main diagnostic, which was the indium octreotide. And you can see here that uh, different isotopes will give you different affinities. So for example, the best affinity was with yttrium dotatate. Uh, the lutetium dotatate had less affinity. So and originally, people started to think about using the yttrium and not the lutetium. This was some work done, actually, this is just with indium. Uh, as we'll see in a minute, indium has an Alge electron, which can be used for therapy, but it only treats about one cell to two cells away from where it is uh, deposited, unlike the beta-emitting isotopes. And here you can see that you do get uptake, very good uptake, particularly with the uh, Tates or the tyrosine Tates compared to the Tox. Uh, these are just all different forms of the somatostatin uh, peptide. And at the bottom is a liver, which had been uh, full of a, uh, this is a mouse model, and this is a neuroendocrine tumor mouse model. And you can see that A, you have a liver uh, that was full of tumor, uh, and B, um, this is a, a mouse that was just treated with um, saline, and B, a similar mouse with a similar inoculation into the liver of tumor treated with the indium uh, octreotide. And you can see that there is uh, no tumor there. So this is, we knew that this stuff should work. And at the time when people were thinking about this, the only thing they had available was the indiumocratide with its Alge electron. And Alge electrons um, have a very short uh, passage, one to two cells, but it could be used for therapy if you can get good targeting. And as we can see with um, in the panels, the images, which are actually uh, my patients, you can see that except for the normal activity in the liver, spleen, and kidneys, and a bit in the bowel, the only other activity you see, and it's arrowed, are the sites of tumor. And this is a patient run with dullary cell carcinoma, the thyroid, and there's tumor in the neck, thorax, and abdomen. And this patient was actually treated with three cycles of the indium octreotide at very high activities, 20 times more than we'd use for imaging. And by the end of uh, a seven-month period, we treated every six weeks, you can see that there was tumor clearance. And this was reflected in uh, the calcitonin returning to normal. But to be honest, uh, you need to give so much of uh, the indium. It was very, uh, very expensive and not very efficient. So we needed to have more killing power for the money that we were spending. And for that, we need a beta emitter, which if you remember is an electron. And this gives us much more tumor damage. And for example, is the main method of tumor clearance in RD131 treatment of thyroid cancer. So Itrium was first of all attached to Dototoc, um, and this was part of a Novartis trial, which was a multi-center phase two trial. And one of the problems we found with Itrium was that it damaged the kidneys, but this could be averted by giving an amino acid uh, infusion with lysine and arginine at the same time. Now, in this study, there were mixed results uh, with fairly high levels of toxicity, particularly to the kidney and the bone marrow, and the company decided not to pursue it. But independently, a group of people were working uh, in the UK, Italy, and Germany, and also with the uh, chemistry teams in Poland to develop a um, different type of peptide, one with higher affinity Dota Tate, as we've heard before, and this was labeled with yttrium. And here you can see um, a, a study that was done by my colleague in Poland around about um, eight years ago, and he has imaging with the technician agent, and you can see multiple liver metastasis, uh, and then this was treated with the yttrium. Now, you can't actually image yttrium directly, but it does produce scatter gamma rays, which we can see called bremsstrahlen. And you can see that just after two cycles of treatment, there is a significant reduction in tumor load within the liver. So it does work, but again, there was some toxicity, first of all, to the kidneys and around about 4% of patients. And a further uh, one to 2% have bone marrow toxicity, such as MDS or acute leukemia. So it was found that whilst the concept was good, we needed a less energetic beta. And that's where lutetium comes in because it has a, a beta which is much less energetic and will um, 
not irradiate so much normal tissue. So lutetium octate uh, was developed by, again, Eric Krenning's team in Rotterdam, working with the Basel Group, and they produced a couple of reports. The first one in 2005, the Journal of Clinical Oncology, didn't really contain a proper dose escalation, partly because of issues with radiation protection, which is very difficult in the Netherlands. But they did treat with 151 patients with cumulative activities between 22 and 30 gigabecquerels of lutetium-17 octretate. They also gave renal protection with amino acid infusions, and they reduced the bone marrow toxicity down to 2%, and it was much less silicone grade 3 to 4 toxicity that we were seeing with the uh, yttrium. These were mainly short-lived grade 2 to 3 toxicities. Uh, in some men, there was a reduction in testosterone level, which did not recover. Uh, but again, this level was not uh, considered to be grade three. It was more grade one to two. There was follow-up data of about 125 patients. And this is how they presented the data. Um, they used a, a standard imaging data technique called SWOG, which looks at CT changes. Uh, um, there is some doubt whether or not this is the correct technique to use in this disease, but that's what they use. So a complete response was no evidence on radiology of any residual disease, and they achieved that in two patients. A partial response was achieved in about 26 patients. They have this thing called minimal response, which is really disease stability. And that's the most common uh, result, and that was seen in over 50% of patients. Uh, and the treatment failed in disease progression in 17% uh, of patients. But I think if you should look at this image of the CT scan, you can see that this is the kind of results that they were showing <clears throat> with not a complete response, but a significant reduction in the number of tumors uh, and recovery of normal liver. And at the bottom, you can see the post-therapy lutetium scan. Lutetium also produces a, a gamma that we can image. And you can see after each of the four cycles, a significant reduction in the activity within the tumours within the liver. A follow-up paper by Dweet Kekenboom from the same group looked at a bigger uh, group of patients, about 310, this was published in the JCM in 2008. And by now they had enough to split the tumour types into car classical carcinoids. Uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumours that were non-functional and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumours that were functional. And you can see here that, uh, again, um, partial response, depending on the tumour type, was between 22 and 60%. Complete response between 1 and 6%, well, 0 to 6%. And again, around about uh, uh, 10 to 15% uh, disease progression. Again, it wasn't proper phase two because they didn't have follow-up on some of the patients. And where there was no follow-up, we have to sort of assume the patients died. And it was difficult to read into the paper how they uh, had um, dealt with that. But when we look at their uh, Captain Meyer curves, you can see that radiological uh, complete response, partial response or disease stability had a very good survival. Uh, and they hadn't reached 50% um, death rate by the end of four years after treatment. Whilst those with progressive disease, they tend to die off quite quickly. And this clearly shows that there's a little biology, I think, in these tumours. And most of these tended to be G3s. Just to show you what you get, this is from one of my colleagues at the Royal Free Hospital. Uh, and this is a patient with uh, liver metastasis for a neuroendocrine tumour. And you have a whole body image and you then have a spec CT image. And you can see that you get very good localization in the tumor. You also have normal uptake. Now in the kidneys is suppressed a bit because of the amino acids, but you also see it in the spleen, a bit in the gut and urine, and then very low level uptake in normal liver. But the rest of the body really doesn't get any uptake of this agent and therefore will not be irradiated. So you don't get the radiation uh, side effects because of the good targeting of the uh, data tape. 
In 2015, there was a meta-analysis that was done in um, South Korea when they reviewed uh, papers with lutetium PRRT. Some of these were formal phase two studies. Some of them were less well-controlled studies. And they found uh, six papers that they thought were of sufficient quality. Three of them were prospective. All of them, but one used the resist criteria for response. One of them used the SWOG criteria, which is an older version of resist. The largest group was 274 patients from the Netherlands. And the smallest group was uh, a paper with 18 patients from Switzerland. And here we have um, the forest plots. So this is a 356 patients where they could find data that they thought was reasonable. And you can see that in terms of disease response rates, that um, there was a, a positive um, story in terms of the fact that you would get um, around about 20, 25% of patients on average seem to get some form of response, which can be measured radiologically. But much more importantly, particularly for patients with carcinoid, in disease control rates, this was well over 80%. And disease control was where you stop the tumor growing, so there's no longer issues with pressure from tumor mass, or you stop the tumor producing the hormones, such as insulin or um, serotonin, that resulted in the syndromic uh, condition. So these patients could either reduce or withdraw, for example, from somatostatin cover. So for most patients, uh, because they've been quite ill, because of the uh, syndromic nature of their tumor before they were treated, even disease control was considered to be a success. But we, what we really need, of course, is a phase three trial. And this was eventually um, set up uh, once the uh, whole system had been commercialized. And uh, this was the NETA-1 trial. And the NETA-1 trial had been agreed with the FDA in the United States and the EMA in Europe. And they basically wanted to test patients who had neuroendocrine tumor, which was um, positive on scan, uh, but were failing treatment with um, somatostatin, uh, such as octreotide at maximum dosage. Now, there is a bit of an issue here in the fact that traditionally with the phase three, you compare against you know, the best supportive care at that time. Um, chemotherapy wasn't considered the best supportive care. So, um, and as they'd already failed the octreotide, it, was, it seemed that it wasn't a sensible idea just to continue with the same dose. So both the FDA and the EMA said, well, why don't you just double the normal dose beyond the maximum of the octreotide and compare that with the radioactive PRRT? And so the two groups, there was 117 patients received uh, lutetium, uh, dototate now, Lutathera, and they received 7,400 megabecalorals or 20, 200 millicuries. And this was given once every eight weeks with amino acid protection. And this was compared against a uh, long acting octreotide, such as uh, octreotide LAR, uh, which was given at 60 milligrams, which is double the normal maximum 30 milligrams uh, for weekly. And there was follow up for uh, up to five years. Now, we haven't actually completed that follow up yet because uh, this trial um, only closed uh, in about 2017. So, in the next year, we should have the final data. But this is the interim report, which was um, published in the New England Journal of Medicine by um, Strasbourg. And what you can see here this is the progression free survival. Um, and progression-free survival in this group that have long, uh, who are long living is probably better than overall survival because it would take you probably another decade to get overall survival. So in terms of progression-free survival, um, you can see that there were 21 events in the Lutathera group versus 70 in the high-dose octreotide group. Unfortunately, the high-dose octreotide group is a very light gray, so you have to look carefully to see it. But you can see there that the median overall progression was 8.5 months which is not surprising as they were progressive disease before it started. Whilst the uh, group that were treated with Lutathera uh, had not reached uh, progression-free survival by around about 30 months. So you can see that there was a significant difference between the two. And it was calculated that the reduction in risk 
it was 82 percent uh, for progression. Um, and certainly by 24 months, all those patients who had not received Lutathera had got progressive disease. So it did seem to make a significant difference in, in progression-free survival. So you can see here, these are the um, um, more data from Strasbourg's paper, the New England Journal. And this is looking at the survival in different groups. And you can see the same curves I showed you yesterday, uh, in the previous slide on the left. The green line is the dotatate, and the black line is the um, high dose octreotide. You can see there is an overall survival curve here. And um, again, there is no um, um, median overall survival for the patients treated with Lutathera by 30 months, whilst for the group that was just treated with high dose um, octreotide, then the uh, median overall survival was only around about 19 months. And the only thing that really uh, all groups, whether or not they were syndromic or non-syndromic, hepatic metastasis, extrahepatic metastasis, bone metastasis, non-bone metastasis, um, the only group that probably didn't do very well were groups with very high chromogranins, and that may just reflect very large disease load. But all other groups, including the greater tumor, gender of the patient, and age, did extremely well, as you can see on the forest plot at the bottom. So anything that is to the left of that line in the middle that shows a positive result. Does it always work? Well, the problem is in some tumors that are more aggressive, then there may be an issue. And there's a nice little bit of work that was done uh, between Italy and um, Denmark, published in 2015, showing that if you had uptake of FDG, then you had a poorer outcome after treatment with lutetium dotatate. Um, this is a sort of whole body FTG because you haven't got the head on this one, but you can see here that this is a patient who is FTG positive, and this patient won't do very well uh, and may be better treated with chemotherapy. And this is uh, Captain Mayer curves from uh, a fairly small study, but showing that FTG positivity was itself a, a poor prognostic. Factor. So in any patient with a uh, high G2 tumor, uh, we would probably uh, want to do an FTG scan. At present, we don't recommend some uh, PRRT for G3 neuroendocrine tumors because the results aren't particularly good. And that was the main group that had progressive disease. So in conclusion, PRRT development did not follow the expected path of a new drug. It was developed within academia and not within a company. But it was a good example of the therapeutic principle that if you can see it, you can treat it. Uh, make, doing a proper dose escalation study was difficult because of radiation protection issues, particularly in the Netherlands. But finally, a phase two and phase three trial has led to market authorization and reimbursement, certainly in North America, Australia, and in Europe. But these principles, um, can now be applied to more common tumours. Uh, it's not actually a peptide, but another ligand called PSMA is now being uh, trialled in metastatic prostate cancer that is both castrated and chemo-resistant. And my last slide, I just want to show you that in the last uh, couple of months, just published in the New England Journal of Medicine, is the results of the VISION trial, which is a phase three trial of lutetium 177 PSMA 617. Uh, the panel of the image is from my, uh, one of my patients showing uptake of the PSMA in a bone metastasis. And this is the kind of patient that if they fail treatment by other means could be treated with this new lutetium PSMA. Uh, and you can see that there is a 38% reduction in risk of death and a 60% reduction in risk of progression. Uh, in patients that have been treated with lutetium 17 PSMA. And the expectation is that this, patient, this substance will be authorized for marketing both in Europe and North America uh, within the next six to nine months. So this is coming your way and will be our next big uh, ferrognostic agent. So thank you very much for listening and I wish you well for the rest of your day.